Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking about the impending Portland public schools teacher strike, Nike losing their prominence with everyday runners, and Oregon's new Medicaid voucher program that helps pay for housing. Joining me on this week's News Roundup are Portland Mercury news reporter Taylor Griggs and our very own lead producer, John Atariani. It's Friday, October 20th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Welcome, everyone, to this week's News Roundup. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, nice to have you back, Taylor. Yes, I'm glad to be here. For those new here, this is when we break down some of the biggest stories of the week. But before we get into it, I like to ask everyone, uh, some might say, a super essential question to get us started. Uh, So today's opening question is inspired by an email sent in responding to this past Wednesday's a show where Brooke Jackson Glidden, the editor of Eater PDX, and I talked about the best nachos in Portland. So a listener wrote in, I was surprised not to hear any coverage of tachos in today's episode, even if just a hot take on whether they are nachos, am I still living in Portland? <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is a fair point. <laughs> um For those of you who haven't heard our tater tot show, we discovered that not only did Oregon invent tater tots, but the tachos were in fact invented right here in Portland. So this leads me to my question, which is a two-parter, y'all. Are tachos nachos? If yes or no, what's your reasoning? And who makes your favorite tachos in town? And if you hate tachos, you must explain yourself and offer us a nacho equivalent. I hope that's enough. I hope that <laughs> I'll break that down. John, did you write that down? I, I got it. Yeah, I've been taking okay, notes. Okay. Yeah, thoroughly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think tachos are not nachos. I think the thing that is essential about a nacho is the crunch factor. And tachos, while delicious, aren't crunchy. So I would say that they are their own delicious treat. I think my favorite tacho is at Hungry Tiger. Excellent choice. Which is a bar that has just killer tachos. I don't know what else to say about it, but they're very good. And amazing vegan corn dogs. Amazing vegan corn dogs. Yeah. One of those places that really nails like vegan food, but like also non-vegan food at the same time. What about you, Taylor? I think it raises interesting linguistic questions. (laughs) Uh, I don't know the etymology of of nachos, kind of the, the, you know, what people would consider really the definition of that. It's a nickname for someone named Ignacio. Just FYI. Did that person invent yeah. nachos? Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, that's actually great <laughs> to know. Well, then now let's ask him because I feel yeah. like he's the only one who could know. <laughs> sure. I'm Mexican. I know Ignacio. Hold okay, on. Okay, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> now I'm being canceled on on air. <laughs> no. No, I led you there. It's okay. It's my fault. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it doesn't really matter. Um, whether they are or not, though, they sound great. I don't think I've ever had tachos. <gasps> oh, um, no. I would definitely be down to eat them. Um, <laughs> although I agree that the crunch factor is very important, I think the toppings, the cheese are, are the most important. I would mm-hmm. say if you have iffy tortilla chips and the toppings are really good, it's going to be way more important than if the chips are somehow amazing and the toppings kind of suck. So since I've never had them, I can't say what my favorite tachos are. But uh, I think Matador does a pretty good nacho happy mm-hmm. hour. They're usually very expensive, but they have two happy hours, I think, then which they're pretty reasonably priced and they're good. I, I love the Matador nachos. Yeah, I think they're pretty good, especially with the steak. Add the steak on. Get yes. a little fancy there. Ooh, yeah. I'm sure that would taste great on tots, too. I'm down to to try it. I'm certainly open to it. Literally go to any pub and ask for tachos. They got them, and they're really good. Yeah. Um, I personally don't think that tachos are nachos, which is why they're called tachos and not nachos. Um, But I do love them. Like, my favorite tachos were the ones that Providence Park would make during their games. But I think they've since stopped making them because they might be, like, a little cumbersome to create, (laughs) to get that line going. But I don't think they're nachos because I agree with exactly with what John said. We need that crunch. Mm -hmm. Or else it's like a bowl. You're eating a bowl. I I do feel like my brain has opened up now, Taylor, of thinking about like what is the essential character of a nacho. And I think I'm going to like stick with my point, but I'm I'm less confident than I was when I started. (laughs) (laughs) From Taylor, who's never had a tacho. John! (laughs) 
I could imagine they get kind of soggy. Taylor is a Tacho philosopher. It's very important to talk to people with different perspectives <laughs> <laughs> well thanks guys thank you for playing on to the news of the week uh taylor what story have you been following this week so i wanted to talk about the pps the portland public schools teachers strike which pretty much for months uh the portland association of teachers which is the union that represents educators from pps have been um, negotiating with the district for a new contract, um, and they're still very far apart on coming to an agreement. And this week, members of the union have been voting about whether or not to authorize a strike. If they vote yes, a strike could begin as soon as, I believe, October 30th, and it'll affect you know all the students who go to PPS, and it'll be the first teacher strike at PPS ever. Oh, in the past, they have authorized a strike, but during the 10-day period, I believe they were able to come to a negotiation, which could happen this time as well. But it seems like, based on all the kind of messaging that's been going out from the district and from the union, seems pretty likely that at least they're going to authorize a strike. What are they asking for? What what is being striked upon? That's not how you say that, but you know, you get it. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, they're asking for more compensation. I wrote a story about this last week and a lot of the teachers are saying that they have to move out of the district or pretty much out of the city in order to afford to live because their salaries aren't covering it anymore. Um, There was one teacher I talked to who really emphasized how important it is for her to live in the community. She rides a razor scooter to work every morning and sees her students as she goes. And it feels important to her that she is a member of the community, but she works at a school in Southeast Portland, inner Southeast, and it's just too expensive for people um, to keep living in that area. So compensation is a big one in a cost of living adjustment. Um, The teachers are saying, yeah, there's some problems within PPS schools that are affecting students, like um, large class sizes. And the teacher I talked to also says that at her school, there's a rat problem that the district has failed to address. Uh. Oh, no. And it's become such a prevalent issue in their school that the kids have started incorporating the rat into like their playground fights. Like they get into... (laughs) <laughs> the kind of Sorry. debates about what to do. I know it's kind of funny, but yeah, it's, <laughs> I laughed when she told me that. I know this is not the right answer, but I'm like, that sounds like that could be kind of adorable. There's like a Disney movie <laughs> vibe too. <laughs> I was thinking the Simpsons. I was like, no, this is like the worst case scenario. This is like, I could see, you know, principal uh, Skinner and like Edna Krabappel just like arguing about what, how they need more money and they point to the rats and there's everyone's just betting on them, you know? Totally. <laughs> yes, like, that actually mm-hmm. sounds... <laughs> <laughs> this sounds so dire and sad. Whenever anyone strikes, the, the, the things they ask for, I'm never like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you yeah. want more money to live where you work and like the things that you need to do your work? That's crazy. Get out of here, you know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, and I've been thinking about this in regards to some of the other labor action that we've seen over the last couple months, like the Kaiser strike comes to mind. That was like a really big deal. That was, you know, that was something like 4,000 workers at Kaiser were on strike in the region. Mm -hmm. Huge deal. But like, you know, there's ways that people can plan differently. They can reschedule something. They can go to a different pharmacy. Like there are ways around it. This is going to be 4,600 educators and 44,000 students, you know? So that's like 44,000, give or take, families that are going to need to figure out mm-hmm. how to make that work. And, you know, it, it it could be like a really big deal for the entire region and for parents and for kids and for everybody. So, I mean, I feel like I always say I like hope that workers get what they need to be able to do their jobs. But like, yeah, if this comes through, this could be a big oof. And yeah, and it and it's wild. Like you know, we're taping Thursday morning. You know, theoretically, by the time this episode gets released on Friday morning, that like this could be a totally different situation. Um, so also, just how how fluid and flexible this feels right now um, is kind of making my head spin. 
Taylor, what have you heard from the parents? Like, what are their concerns? Are they like generally behind what the teachers are striking for or are they concerned? Well, I think there's probably a mix. I mean, I'm sure that most of the parents want their students to be in schools that don't have rats in them and probably <laughs> smaller so. classes. Mm -hmm. um, and the teacher who I talked to last week said, yeah, she's heard supportive things from parents and just wanted to emphasize that, you know, even if a strike will be a disruption to the students, the current conditions that they're facing within the schools are disrupting their learning as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure that there it will be difficult because parents rely on schools essentially for child care during the day. Um, I There are some contingency plans that PPS is putting out and um, they'll still have some things open like school lunches. I believe they'll have grab and go meals available. Um, some health centers will be open within the schools, but it's not going to be the same thing. It'll be interesting to see how people kind of figure this out. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that because teachers are so important for so many reasons, a strike will impact people. And that's kind of the point. I mean, it's like, yeah. they know how, much of an impact this could have a negative one on, on their students and they don't want to strike, but they feel like it's the right thing to do for, for the students. Yeah. I hope those teachers get literally everything they want and more. Like I can't, <laughs> they get so little, like teachers are so important. And I, it's just like when you talk about nurses, you're just like, yeah, just give it, just give it to them. Yeah. Let's move on. We have a lot of money. This is where it should go. Let's move, wrap it up. Let's move on. Stop arguing. Yeah. Get the rats out. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. The fact that's an ass. Mm, could we please not have the bubonic plague come back into the system? Um, please, perchance. <laughs> this is like a Jesus Christ. Totally. Sorry. It just kind of shows kind of the situation going on at some of these schools. Um, it's just tricky because the district and the union right now are so far apart. The district really maintains that they don't have enough money to, to pay the compensation that the teachers are asking for. There is about a hundred million dollars in reserves, um, that the union kind of calls a nest egg where the district says it's necessary to keep money in reserves you know, in case an emergency happens. Um, I think another issue here is that the, I guess this, this may need to be handled on like a state legislative oh, yeah. level, which is just yeah. to give more money to the schools. Good thing we have that on lock. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, that's going to be really easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> And they can uh, do it quickly too. So yeah, it will not be hard at all. Well, the good news is that sports are going to be fine. Did you guys see this story? I did see that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So this this is from the Oregonian. Uh, Nick Strang at the Oregonian reports that, uh, yeah, the teacher strike will not stop varsity athletics. So high school football. Thank God. <laughs> good to go this fall. Oh, my God. Sports will continue. <laughs> my heart will go on. Yes. <laughs> oh, Taylor, thank you so much for your reporting on this. And um I'm just, I'm so frustrated. Everything John just made me even more frustrated. Like, I'm just like, Jesus, well, not you, John, personally, you know. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's interesting, too, because there are other unions within PPS, several others, and they're all in contract negotiations, too. And m many people are not pleased with what's going on with mm -hmm. their union. So, for example, the nutrition services people, so the people who give lunch to kids and, um, Kind of like teachers assistants and and people like that all of their unions are also upset yeah <laughs> most cafeteria staff make less than twenty four thousand dollars a year which is oh, terrible that's in that's like hurtful i know it's not even insulting it's like hurtful like what the hell yeah i guess i mean these people really value the, what they do and and helping kids it's really important um twenty four thousand dollars a year it's is terrible. That's like, yeah. Mm. So I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, at some point, although they're having certain programs up now. It might domino fall is what I'm Yeah. Hearing. I mean, yeah. some other things might go down as well. And if the yeah. teachers come back and then they end up in another kind of battle with another union, mm -hmm. there could be some disruptions for quite a while. Well, Taylor, thank you so much. John, what's your story? 
Uh, I'm talking about Nike. Uh, this is from Matthew Kish at the Oregonian. Finally, somebody. S- finally, somebody's <laughs> talking about Nike. No, it, he put out this really interesting story. So he's talking about Nike and, you know, traditionally Nike started as a running company, right? Like that is the entire legacy and story of how Nike came into being. Um And his story is about how Nike still has the corner on really high end runners, like a lot of like marathon champions run in Nikes, but they're sort of losing their grip on average everyday runners. The the story talks about specifically Brooks and Hoka that are skyrocketing and their market Mm -hmm. share is growing where Nike's, you know, isn't having the same level of sales for these casual runners, Mm -hmm. which makes sense to me. Like I'm a runner. Like I haven't worn Nikes in many years. You know, I like, I got a pair of Brooks. Um, But yeah, it's just this interesting thing that they're, the the article is speculating that Nike sort of took its eye off the ball with these sort of everyday runners. And these other companies are really jumping in and growing like crazy to fill that market. Yeah. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I don't run ever. Uh, <laughs> hold on. Like, Taylor doesn't eat tachos. Taylor doesn't run. I ride my bike, but it doesn't matter what shoes I'm wearing. On I wear sometimes five-inch platform heels to ride my bike. So that's just an aside. You can ride your bike wearing any shoes. Anyway. Wow, flex. Yeah. But I think if I was... Well, I, I guess Nike to me seems like a, the brand I might turn to if I was going to start. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, that's all you know. Like, you're just like, yeah, Nike, right? Well, kind of. They're sort of like the generic, at least for, I think for many people, but especially for people who live in, in Oregon. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I have any Nikes. Um, <laughs> I don't have any of the other ones either, though, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Are they worse shoes or like the other? Does it matter that much, I guess? what? Yeah, like, John, John, why do you run on Brooks and not in Nikes? yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things there, – there's sort of like two things that the article brings up. One, um, Nike has really pulled away from like doing sales through retailers and have really focused on sort of direct-to-consumer business. And like, yeah, if I'm buying new shoes, I go into a running store and mm-hmm. like sort of browse what they have. And more and more, they don't have Nikes on those walls, you know, mm-hmm. because there's been a shift in strategy – at Nike not to do that. Um, But the other thing is like, and and like what the article talks about is that a lot of people are like, look, like these other shoes are more comfortable. And I, and I think that that's true. You know, is that what you think? I mean, like you look at Hoka's in particular, and this might get Mm -hmm. like a little bit running nerdy here, but like Hoka's are like super ultra cushiony shoes, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, particularly prefer them but they do sort of feel like you're running on like a big bed of foam and like that's really appealing to a lot of people so it's also kind of a design question that like these other brands are taking a different strategy of how to design their shoes than what nike has done and like you know customers are responding to it yeah i think hokas are also a big brand for um, medical professionals because they're on their feet all day Mm mm-hmm and I can only imagine if you're just like, oh, this is a very comfortable shoe. And you're like, I'm going to buy a pair of shoes to run and walk around all day. And it's just like, you're not going to be like two separate shoes. Like, you're just like, this is the one. Here's my yeah. shoe. That makes sense, though. That makes sense about not having really like a an outlet of sorts to go through. Because so I'm also like to run. I do have Nikes. Hey, keep it hey, real, Claudia Mesa. <laughs> I'm keeping it real. No, I used to work at an ad agency that where you could only ever wear Nikes. I think I can guess which ad agency that I is. Don't, it's, a little, it's, it's a little shop. You never heard of it. You've yet. never heard of it. So, um, but because of it, you would get to go to like the employee store. And so when I knew I was going to leave, I like stocked up. Like, I was like, my feet aren't going to freaking like grow, right? Just so, so everyone knows how cheap I am. So I have a few pairs, like until those pairs run out. <laughs> but my, my uh, partner, as you know, she works in the medical uh, profession. And she basically said that one of the best things to do in town is to go to um, like Roadrunner in Northwest or like there's the, the Portland running store. They actually like take molds or like they, they do stuff with your feet where you mm-hmm. actually learn the exact size, but guess what shoes they have up there? Brooke, yeah, Hoka. Yeah. They don't have yeah. Nikes. 
Yeah. You know? Like in the article, it talks about foot traffic in Selwood. It says they have 16 models of Brooks, 13 models of Hoka's. Uh, the store has a Nike account, but they choose not to sell its running shoes. I would wonder if maybe they're, if more and more stores like that aren't selling them, it could just be you go into a store and they don't have Nikes and that's why you're not. So maybe it's kind of a t- top down sort of thing. Well, it definitely is. And like, you know, what what this article says is that like, you know, Wall Street actually loves the strategy of going direct to consumers because if you sell directly to a consumer, it can create more profits. Um, but yeah, it is creating this window for these little these little upstarts to uh, skyrocket in sales. Um, I mean, and just to give like a little bit of context of like the scale that we're talking about here, like Hoka had 1.4 billion in sales last year. And that's like 60% increase from the year before. Brooks is at about 1.2 billion in sales. Nike ended their fiscal year with $51 billion in sales. Okay. (laughs) So they're going to be fine. So Nike is still the big dog. I don't want to like create any sort of impression that like Nike's going under or anything. (laughs) Nike doing fine, but like. (laughs) (laughs) I assumed as much, but yeah. And it could also even be a thing where they're just like, we don't care about this market as much. Like that's not where the money's coming in. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. This is me speculating, everyone. That's not what Nike said. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the only other thing that I'll say is that like all of this is interesting because it's coming sort of in parallel with another story about Nike that Matthew at the Oregonian reported um, about this discrimination lawsuit that like, do, do you guys remember this story at all? So a couple years ago, there was this big discrimination lawsuit started in 2018, alleged that Nike is, quote, hostile towards and devalues women. Um, Kind of hit like a big roadblock last year. A judge ruled against a motion trying to make it into a class action. Well, within the last couple of weeks, there is this new wrinkle in that story where this former human resources manager came in and like basically said that Nike used prior pay to determine what people are going to be making, um, which is sort of furthering discriminatory practices. Of course, Mm -hmm. because women usually get paid less. It's like really nasty. So this lawsuit that everybody was like, eh, this isn't going to go anywhere. Now they're all like, oh, shit, like this this lawsuit could be back on, alleging like just really gnarly gender pay gaps at Nike. Um, There's also the child labor. uh, I mean, there is the child labor. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) You know, maybe Nike doesn't signal you're a runner, a serious runner anymore. And I think that could be a good thing, like to have maybe the running community is becoming less elitist about what shoes you're wearing and you're free to make your own choices now. Mm -hmm. Uh Well, thanks, John, for bringing us a business story. I feel like we rarely ever talk about biz here in the show. <laughs> love, love talking about shoes. <laughs> well, all right, we'll take a quick break here. And when we return, more news of the week. Are you tired of seeing Portland city government be so weak sauce? Progress Portland is a team of locals who come together to advocate for a more diverse, progressive city council in 2024. On our podcast, we interview exciting candidates like Angelita Murillo, running in District 3. When I talk to people about public safety and public health, I try to explain to them that housing is public health and public safety. Adequate services for addiction, all of that is public safety. And Steph Routh, running in District 1. How do we knit together better policies that lift all boats, that we achieve shared prosperity? District representation and an expanded council will mean a greater voice for the people of Portland. We want a city council that will fight for fair pay and strong unions, housing the homeless, and true police reform. Subscribe to the Progress Portland podcast now wherever you listen to podcasts and join our grassroots movement at progressportland.org. So this week, I wanted to talk about a story that NPR did on how like several states are going to be rolling something out that Oregon is the first in the nation to do, which is a program that allows for Medicaid to pay for housing. So like just how they would use Medicaid to pay for like doctor visits or other health related costs, they can now use it to pay for rent, you know? So for those who may not know, Medicaid provides health care for tens of millions of low-income people, like more than one in five Americans, 
are on Medicaid. And the thinking behind all this, which I'm sure you could piece together, is that it's been proven that houseless people with ongoing health conditions like diabetes or severe asthma or anything else that needs like, you know, regular doctor visits have to resort to repeated and expensive emergency room visits that eats up like state funding at the end. So the bet here is that keeping vulnerable populations out of emergency rooms will save the state enough money to pay for increased housing costs, which is what they're like really trying to focus on is like our housing crisis. And it would also help keep people off the street. So it's like a win-win situation. And the program is only targeted at people who are homeless or in danger of becoming so and have these chronic conditions. And so the story that I read followed the journey of a man who was living on the streets here in Oregon and recently lost both of his feet because of undiagnosed diabetes. Because he was living in a tent and he couldn't get to services. And so now he's on the path to recovery in an apartment building only blocks away from like a wound facility where his recent amputations are being cared for. He reported, he's like, yo, I take five to six medications a day and I need to get these wounds cleaned out like three times a week. If I were still living on a tent, like I would be dead. There's just no way for me to be able to keep up this like, you know, crazy medical regime. Mm -hmm. And he also, because of, of the state funding, there's also like services, like there's helpers that come through and help him get to places because he's, you know, right now in a wheelchair. So he's being taken care of, you know. They reported that even with all of this care that he's getting and the vouchers for his housing, in the long run, it's still less taxing on the healthcare system than just depending on emergency care, and he's alive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what do you guys think? Ugh, I mean, I think this is fascinating and, like, super complicated and, like, potentially one of those fixes for, like, our housing crisis that is enough outside of the box that it could really change people's lives, you know? There's a lot of paths that lead towards people being houseless, but the idea of, like, yes, you have a chronic health condition, so you can't work, so then you can't pay rent, so then you end up living in a tent is, like, the most depressing and imaginable, and mm -hmm. trying to come up with a fix for that is really exciting. I mean, I imagine that there's going to be a lot of kinks in this system that need to be worked out, uh, but I'm here for it. Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting too. And in addition to, you know, not being able to work, I I'm also not sure of the statistics here, but people who just have so much debt in medical bills that they end up losing their homes. I'm mm -hmm, sure that there mm -hmm. are some people in mm -hmm. this country who are in that situation. Like one or two probably, <laughs> just like right? Yeah. God, it's just terrible. Um, I would say that making the point clear that housing is healthcare is really important. And I, mm -hmm. I would imagine, yeah, that the medical systems are spending a lot of money on these emergency kind of treatments that, you know, only last so long when you're out in the conditions of that you are, if you don't have a home. Especially in Oregon, it's wet and cold here. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, yeah, and emphasizing preventative care, I would I think it's a great idea, really. I didn't expect for me to, like, say these things. I mean, like, what do you guys think? And for both of you to be like, well, fuck this shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really I was. I was like, yeah, every, I know this is a, everyone's going to be like, yeah, duh, this is awesome. Can I, can I tell you my one concern, though? I do. Yes. I'm interested in the argument against it. All right. It's not an argument against it. So here, here on the show, we've talked to a good number of people that are working on solving our city's housing crisis. You know, some have boots on the ground in shelters. Some have been policymakers or like advocates. And everyone is pretty much saying the same thing. We need services for folks that need not just housing, but drug recovery programs, mental health facilities. You know, all this needs to work in tandem. We're getting certain folks housed. So I just hope this program is focused on the people who are like already receiving these services or just have the capacity to live indoors and with other people. And it seems like it is targeting just these people with severe health conditions like the man that was mentioned in the story. But uh, Taylor, there's another story by Courtney Vaughn, your, your colleague here, who wrote about uh, the Argyle mm -hmm. Garden Apartments. It's a 72-unit building in the Kenton neighborhood. Um, and it was all meant to house very low-income residents or those moving out of homeless shelters. So it was very much a transition, like, hey, you guys are ready for this. This was, like, the goal. Uh, but the tenants were reporting filthy conditions, assault, rampant theft, squatters, 
squad of just people coming through and being like, I live here now. <laughs> and unresponsive management that, that led to at least one resident fleeing for safety and others just going back to the shelters. Um, and the thing that was missing here was guidance and tools for building essential life skills. And I feel like we kind of forget about that when someone's been living on the streets for like decades um, and maybe just coming through, just getting recovery for mental health issues or drugs. Um, they're going to need a bit more than just, here's a house, here's a bed, go, bye, you know? I totally hear that and like echo concerns about implementation. And I can I'm already hear the like, sort of conservative, like, political spin on this of, like, they're taking Medicaid and just giving people free houses, which... <laughs> it's not what it is. You know, I don't agree, I don't agree with, but, like, it, I can absolutely hear that argument in my head yeah. already. Um, but something that, I that like, got me thinking in this article was sort of thinking about healthcare and, like, cost, right? Because we do have this problem in America where, like, healthcare is really, really expensive. But one of the people in the article argues, like, look, like, the whole point of healthcare isn't to do it as cheap as possible. <laughs> like, that's not the end goal. We're, we're not, like, trying to, like, run a cost-efficient business. We're trying to help people, you know? We're trying to, like, make people healthy. And so maybe we should think of that as a worthwhile investment. I mean, there are systemic problems that need to be fixed, but also, like, yeah, this is something that, they're, like, what is a better thing to spend money on than, like, helping people live healthy lives? The thing that makes me hopeful, though, with this new Medicaid uh, program is that people who who have the the money piles and the and the policy making are finally thinking about our houseless crisis uh, outside of the box, in a sense, like some thinking different ways. You know what I'm saying? I'm just imagining <laughs> the literal money pile. I'm just imagining just <laughs> them sitting like like a Scrooge McDuck sort of like sitting on their pile of money and being like, who should we give it to? <laughs> we're just throwing it in there with our taxes. And we're just like, I hope I hope this goes where it's supposed to go. It's true. You know, and yeah. then it just automatically gets formed into a missile and like flies away to some other country we don't know about. But anyhow, that's what I think. And I'm just like, <laughs> John's face. He's just like, oh, no, we're cutting that out. No, I <laughs> I was thinking of another total like diversion that would have derailed this conversation and I decided not to go for it. <laughs> but I was smiling to myself of how it would have been funny had I launched us down that path. John, now we need it. What is it, John? What I was thinking about was, uh, have you seen the photos from like, this is like totally a diversion, but like all this bullshit going on in Congress about like the House Speaker leadership. But have you seen the photos of the stacks of pizza? <laughs> what? <laughs> There are, no. I've seen photos on Twitter of like pallets full of like dozens and hundreds of pizzas that are going into Congress to like feed all the legislators as they squabble over uh, who's going to lead the House of Representatives. No, they don't deserve pizza. 400 pizzas stacked high for legislators. And we're paying for that. I'm imagining them without boxes, just piles. <laughs> no. no, no, they, they they are in boxes. Loose pizzas. It's just, yeah, 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 it's loose. a stack of loose pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> that is what they deserve. John just wants more pizza. Taylor, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. I think that even though preventative care, um, it, it does save money, you know, I, I assume because emergency treatment is, is more expensive. That's not really the primary reason that I support it. Like, I, I, I think it's good if it saves money. And, mm -hmm. but, you know, I guess if it could help more people, I think that that would be good. Um, it's also just less taxing on the, the workers and on the, the people who are experiencing these health problems. Um, if you're constantly mm -hmm. going to the emergency room or having exactly, to, that's just, it sucks. It's not a good kind of lifestyle to be living. So regardless of the money savings, I think it, it would be great for people that just not to be in the situation where they need emergency care all the time. Totally. And a lot of people, unfortunately, I mean, this is another kind of speculative comment, but because of how... Hold on, speculation coming through. <laughs> <laughs> it's so tough to be on the streets and in the winter and there's a... Yeah, it's it's cold. There's a variety of, of really terrible issues you, you face in those conditions. And unfortunately, without access to health care... Yeah, people turn to to drugs to so. So I think that this could be sort of a another solution to that as well. Yeah. Well, we did it. Another Friday roundup. I hope everyone listening um, checks out these articles that we read. You should uh, go to our show notes. We'll have links to anything we discussed. Uh, 
And John Taylor, I hopefully I'll see you some other time. I don't know, John, maybe tomorrow, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Thanks, guys. May, yes. may your weekend be full of tachos. What a beautiful blessing. Oh. That is really nice. Thank you, John. John, you know what? You should just bless every end of fr- I just want a new blessing from John every <laughs> Friday. <laughs> just, just pizza and tachos. That's just, all I'm thinking about today. Back to pizza. <laughs> Before we end the show, I wanted to share a correction for yesterday's episode about the COVID flu and RSV viruses. And I'm just going to let a pediatrician explain via her voicemail. Hi, my name is Erica. I just listened to the podcast about viruses and um, there's some misinformation there. I'm a pediatrician um, and babies six months and older, not eight months and older, as Erin said, can get the COVID vaccine and flu vaccine. And then for the RSV, it's not a vaccine, it's immunoglobulin, passive immunity, so there is a difference there. Um, And it's for babies from birth to eight months. Only babies eight to 19 months old can get it if they are high risk. Erica would also like to add that not all outpatient practices have the RSV immunoglobulin, and it's very expensive if insurance doesn't cover it, but families should check with their infant's primary care office if they are interested. Thanks so much to Erica and Ashley who wrote in for letting us know. If you ever have any comments on anything you hear on the show, feel free to email us at portland at citycast.fm or leave us a voicemail at 503-208-5448. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. Our lead producer is John Atariani. Our audio producer is Julia Fioglioni. Our newsletter editor is Rachel Monahan, and our host is me, Claudia Meza. Original music by Jenny Conley and Stephen Drizos. Additional music by Epidemic Sound and All the Kimonos. We'll be back Monday morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slims. <laughs> <laughs>